بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so we're back with brother jalil today alhamdulillah today we're going to talk about many different subjects but they're interlinked with one another as you will see inshallah uh, me and brother jalil or brother jalil was informing me or teaching me a few days ago about a few things um, one was what's happening with uh, COVID, I don't know, or the circus 19 is a better word, maybe. And, uh, and then we started talking about sound and the power of sound. And, uh, and then uh, we started talking about Zulqarnain and why perhaps uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions iron and copper so these are some interesting subjects that we're going to talk about today and uh trust me when we talk about the iron and copper it might become very practical for a lot of people and uh the rest of it is also important in terms of protection and building your iman okay bismillah so brother jalil i'll let you take it uh, i wish you could repeat the exact same thing that we talked about, but you know, let's see how this goes, what Allah wills from this conversation. We will try, um, but I encourage you to um, interrupt with any thoughts and ideas you have so that we can make it uh, a discussion rather than just a, a bland lecture. Uh, sometimes I wonder whether it's worthwhile getting maybe selecting, you know, 10 or 20 of your students, your viewers, you know, and maybe having a group discussion. I think at some point in the future, that may be a beneficial thing to do. And because many, many people have pieces of the jigsaw through their experience, through their knowledge. And when you bring all those people together, you get a bigger and a wider picture of what's happening in the world in front of you. And it help, that helps to understand the Quran. Um, so we had a couple of subjects that we wanted to talk about and one of them was the significance of iron and copper in today's age so the way that i think norm, the way that i think normally is surah al-kahf it is established that this surah is the surah that sits on top of all the surah of the Quran when it comes to the subject of Akhir as zaman the end of times. Where do I get that from? I get that from two ahadith. One, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that if you see the jal, then recite in one riwayah, the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. They will not be able to harm you. That the fitan of the Dajjal will not be able to harm you. Another one is that if you recite Surah Al-Kahf on Yawm al Jumu'ah, the nur will emanate from within you and it will last until the next Jumu'ah. So what is the purpose of nur? You have to ask why are we being told this? Will I have a need for noor? Is that why I'm being told it? Okay, so what is this noor going to do? Well, noor is light. But what is the purpose of light? Is to allow you to see. It's as simple as that. But why do I have to have more light in Akhru Zaman? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned that the shirk and in relation to Akhiru Zaman, the shirk of Akhiru Zaman will be very difficult to identify. Mm -hmm. And the example that he gave was, it's like a black ant that sits on a black rock in the dead of the night. So if I send you out in the middle of the night and say there's a black rock there, there's a black ant on it, go and get it. But you're only allowed to take one thing with you. You have to take a torch. So if we do not have noor, then how are we going to be able to identify the shirk of Akhir zaman 
people have a very fundamental view of what shirk is, thanks to the Saudi regime. That is where it comes from. It is a definition of shirk to attribute partners to anyone other, you know, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah has partners. One Sahabi, after hearing the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the nations before you, they committed shirk. One Sahabi, he stands up and he says, Ya Rasulullah, when I was Christian, we didn't commit shirk. So then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the definition of shirk. He said, when your priests made halal, what Allah made haram, that was shirk. And when they made haram, what Allah made halal, that was shirk. And in the end times, this is the type of definition you need to be fully aware of as a definition of shirk. That when governments, World Health Organization, World Economic Forum, doesn't matter who it is, start making things halal for you that Allah has commanded as haram, or start making things haram for you that Allah has commanded as halal, that is what shirk is. But if you don't have noor, you won't see it coming. So, and, and Allah the, does not accept shirk in his commands. Yeah. And people recite, they read Surah Al-Kahf and they come across the story of the, the two neighbors with gardens, the two brothers. And they have made this assumption that the man was going into his garden and making sujood. He wasn't. But his love for his garden was so much. His love for it was so much that he thought, this is all I need. Meaning, my dependence is on the garden, it's not on Allah. When your dependence is on something other than Allah, hada shirk. That is shirk. And what do we have today? We have a disease that is spreading amongst the ummah. And the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called it Hubbud Dunya. In reference to the enemies of Islam overcoming the Muslims, they asked, Ya Rasulullah, will we be few in numbers? No, you will not. Rather, you will be like the foam of the sea. A lot of it. But tell me about the foam of the sea. It's driven by an undercurrent. The foam reflects the system below it. Do we see that in Muslims today? Yes, we see it. The Muslim name, the Muslim appearance, but everything we do reflects modern Western civilization. Then he gave the indication as to when your enemies will going to be able to overcome you. He said, Allah will cause them not to have fear in their hearts for you. And that will happen when you have two things. Number one, an aversion to death, a fear of death. Number two, love of this world. And I want to add to that, that when love of the world increases over the deen, then the deen becomes a mazhab, a religion. Just a bunch of rituals you need to satisfy yourself. And it has no practical relevance in the world that you live in, or loses, rather, practical rele relevance in the world that you live in, because your love of dunya relegates the, the, the truth or religion as a side thing, as a, something to alleviate your guilty feeling, or to give you a sense of, I'm a good person, and you do some good deeds and you do some prayers, and you do this and that, but you have lost the actual integrity of the deen as a whole. And that, I think, is what is part of 
the symptoms of love of dunya is what happens to the deen, is that the deen becomes reduced to a religion. But the love of the dunya leads to a road that is full of danger, and the warning is in the Quran. Mm. The love of the dunya will, I will guarantee it, cause you to start living like them. Sooner or later, sooner or later, as it increases, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, given us in this dunya. But when it becomes the focus of our life, when we teach the importance of the dunya to our children over the port importance of the akhirah, then who, who are you to then complain when you say that your children have done this or they're doing this? <laughs> you know, I've been seeing this for a long, long time. Going to the masjid as a young man and seeing um, people there and they're not really in the masjid that often. They have children and families. And as they grow older and older, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases them in hidayah to the point where no matter how early you get to the masjid and fajr, they're there before you. Then one day you're sitting in their company and they're complaining to the sheikh and saying, my son's done doing this, my daughter's doing that. You know, Wait, how did that happen? When you look at the person, you think to yourself, he's a pious man. He decides Quran, he doesn't miss Salab al Jama'ah. How did this happen? Well, 20 years ago, he never cared about the deen. Whatever you sow, you have to reap. How, how do I know if I'm going to increase or decrease in Hidayah between now and the time I die? These things are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something very important when you have people getting married. Mm -hmm. And one person is at one level, one person is at another level. And how often do you see the. the the tables turn 10 years later, 12 years later, 15 years later. You know, that the person who was more ahead in the deen has abandoned it, and the person who never really cared has slowly, slowly, slowly grasped it and, 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 and made it part of their, their, their life. Hmm. So we have to think of the future. The West thinks 500 years, 1,000 years ahead. And we'd be lucky if we think from one Juma to the other. In fact, if we did think from one Juma to, to another, we would make sure to look at half compulsory for ourselves, and we haven't even done that. That's how short sighted we are. Hmm. So, if I look at Surah Al Kahf as the surah, and I've given the evidence for it of Akhirul Zaman, then everything that is in that surah has a relevance to this day, and its relevance is only going to increase. Absolutely. So, when they come to Dhul Karnayn and they say, creating facade in the land. Can you help us? We'll give you a payment. And he says, I don't need a payment. You know, then he asks for two things. Bring me iron and copper. And he builds a barrier. The word used there is a barrier. He builds a barrier, constructs a barrier with molten iron. Iron that is melted down and the furnace is blown onto until it can be used, it's malleable, and it can be used to create a physical barrier. If you are of the opinion that Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj are living underground, and they are going to be released into the dunya after the turn of Isa alayhi salam. Switch off this video and don't waste your time. That is not my opinion. No, it's not right at all. My, and thanks to Sheikh Amran Hussain, my primary source of knowledge is the Quran. I cannot bring 50,000 ahadith and argue with the Quran. It's not a, it, it can't happen. You have to go to the Quran first. And in the Quran, Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj are only mentioned in two ayah. So it's not difficult to do your research. So Ya'ajuj and Ma'ajuj, they are placed behind the barrier of iron and copper. I would challenge most people who 
watch your channel and ask them to tell me what is the subject that keeps on coming up in conversation in the past two years. And I will guarantee that that subject is the Great Reset. That it keeps coming up, what they're planning, what they're going to do. Those if that I, even know about this. I mean, then there's the, you know, the, I, I don't want to mention Hamza Yusuf, but Hamza Yusuf had a conversation with, what's his name? Carl's, Ch Claus, Charles, Charles Claus. And, I mean, he's aware of what's happening, but he hasn't informed the Muslim public of what these people are planning. I find that very surprising. The reason why people are not scholars, are not able to warn the people, is because they have not linked to what they can see with their eyes to the Quran. That link is missing. If they could link it to the Quran, they would say, look, there's the evidence in the Quran. This is what I'm seeing. Be warned. That's what it is. This is about scholarship. I have a lot of respect for Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. The man has so much knowledge. He's well read. He's well versed. He traveled to seek knowledge. He traveled a lot to learn, sacrificed a lot. And I can't just throw that aside. But as Sheikh Imran Hussein will say again and again and again, in this day and age, it is the scholarship of Khidr, the scholarship of connecting the dots, and the scholarship of Basira, of insight that is necessary. If I then say, okay, we're all talking about the Great Reset, tell me one thing, use four or five words or one phrase to tell me how they're going to change the world. And I will guarantee that the words digital will be in there. And it will be digital health, digital money, digital buying and selling, digital in movement, everything, all down to looking at the expressions on your face and predicting your thoughts and your mental state. It's all going to be digital. This is not something that people dispute. If I then break down the word digital into what is this? What is this? It's radio frequencies. That's what it is. So you have your artificial intelligence. You have your digital network and passport. You have that devil, Elon Musk, putting hundreds and hundreds of satellites. He wants to make sure that even the even the empty part of the desert has got internet connection. Forget water for people. If people don't have water, that's okay. But we need to make sure they've got internet access. This is how corrupt these people are and they call themselves human beings. If I'm able to recognize that the fetan that's coming very soon from the hands of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, actually I'm going to change the word to facade. The facade that's coming at the hands of Ya'juj wa Ma'juj is all based on radio frequencies, millimeter wave technology, AI, 5G, 6G, and so on. Your ability to, to, to connect with other human beings because you've got chips inside of you, radio frequencies inside your body. And you talked about this not long ago, about the, the natural pulse of the earth, the frequency of the earth. And if you have a natural frequency and you bring in an unnatural frequency, if this one stays as it is and you keep increasing, increase, then the effects of this one become less. Yeah. Then based on scientific research, if I say to myself, well, how can I protect myself against radio frequency? Can I create a barrier against this? And my view has always been to run from it to get away from it, to go and live an old way of life, the way of life that existed before the advent of electricity. Mm. That to me is a natural way of life. And that way of life existed from Adam al Islam all the way until modern Western civilization had reached the industrial revolution. <laughs> I've now realized that you cannot run away from it completely. It's going to encompass the entire world, this web. This web is going to encompass the entire planet. 
then can I find a solution? So during my research, and many, many times, I'm a simple-minded person, and so things that are complicated go over my head. But many times, the solution of what you're looking for is very simple. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a blessing from him, that for any man, any human being, if they have a problem, the solution, Allah has made it simple, not complex. So in my research, I came across, you know, I've always known about Faraday cages. So a Faraday cage, or the best of Faraday cages, are those that are made of iron and copper. And the purpose of a Faraday cage is to protect whatever is inside the cage from radio frequencies. Is that a coincidence? Of course not. I have, I have to ask myself. Then someone whose speciality is health, I took note of the fact that the number one deficiency of micronutrients and minerals within the human body in the age of Akhir Zaman is iron deficiency. Hmm. And one of the yes. things you need in your body to ensure the absorption of iron, guess what? Copper. Copper. That isn't an accident. Yeah. So we as Muslims, we need to make sure that we're getting enough iron through our food, if not in supplements. We need to make sure that we get enough iron, uh, enough copper through our food, and if not through supplements. And interestingly enough, it's very interesting, one of the signs of a severe copper deficiency is blindness. Mm. It's blindness. And I relate not being able to understand these things to spiritual blindness. That if you don't have copper, you risk going blind. And if you don't have iron, then you will fall prey to the facade of Ya'juj or Ma'juj. This is something that I, I only came across um, about a week, 10 days ago, while I was just sitting, you know, alone, pondering over Surat al So I've, I've, I've yet to do more research on it, but there is a connection with absolute certainty between what is in that surah and what is happening to the world today. And if Dhulqar 9, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the actions of Dhulqar 9 was showing you and me today, how we may be able to protect ourselves from this facade. Because this facade will reach a level that your brain will no longer be under your control. You will not have the capacity to think. And from the time of Adam al Islam until the end of times, the time where thinking is an absolute necessity is Akhir Zaman. If we refuse to think, then we fall into that category of creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al Anfal. And I think it's ayah number 22. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that the worst of creation. When you hear the word worst of creation, think of all the creation. Think of the jinn, the human beings, and, and everything else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that the worst of creation in his eyes are those that are dumb and deaf and those who refuse to use their aql, their reasoning. And to be labeled that by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you be okay with that? How can you be okay traveling through this dunya on the way to the akhirah, on the way to a gathering, a day where you will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that you fall into that category, the worst of something, and you have hope of getting into Jannah. For me, that's a dilemma. 
it's a big worry. So that so far is my few words on iron and copper. I still have a lot of research to do. I am looking at potentially advocating that people increase their supplements. They have Faraday cages. Um, so the body regenerates most when you're sleeping. Uh, so many amazing things happen when you sleep, especially in deep sleep. So I'm now thinking of, if we can't protect ourselves 24 seven from a Faraday cage, then at the very least, when you go to sleep, you should be sleeping in conditions where you are not subjected to radio frequencies. And in addition to that, I may be saying to people to wear um, an item of copper and an item of iron as well. If you're able to get them both together, you know, bonded together, great. If not, I know that iron's also very good in Rukia. Yeah, especially the granules. If you get granules of iron, you know, and you actually throw them on the patient when doing the recitation, you can gather them up and keep doing it. Mm. They generally react in a very severe way compared to not doing that. Yeah, I mean, Suleiman would cage them in iron chains. Yeah. So, so there is that aspect. Uh, and of course, it seems at least biologically, that copper and iron go together, as you mentioned, because the absorption of iron is dependent upon the amount of copper you have. So just to go back, uh, because so that the viewers have the logic down, the word Zulqarnain means two epochs, two Qarans two millennials, you can two, two times, two different ages that have something similar between them. And in the first one, Zulqarnain built a wall of iron and copper, a physical wall of iron and copper, which means that the Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not some sort of ghosts and monsters or some funny creatures that, you know, that that the physical barrier is not a physical barrier for them, but rather um, that physical barrier is the barrier that you make for human beings. And uh, so, and the word fasad, generally in Quran, is not used for animals fighting animals or ghosts fighting humans. The word fasad is used for human beings or for jinns. So anyway, so you have this connection of iron and copper being part of the solution that Zulqarnain was able to employ at his age. And now in the age of Fitan, what also the wall of Zulqarnain tells us is that all these electromagnetic waves that we have the 5g the 4g all this this is going to become very we're we're headed we're headed in a direction that is so untested that is so like we're going at warp speed in a direction that we've never tested and we're assuming that progress means uh, that progress is always good the, the assumption that progress or moving forward in full speed ahead is always good and what the Quran is saying that no nope. and what causes that is hubbud dunya right the love of the world we also want to control our clouds and we also want to control our you know vegetation and we want uh, automated systems that produce our gardens for us our the, dunya for us the category of the fitin that's referred to here is labeled by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as fitan as-sarra wa dharra. As-sarra is convenience. That's what it means. So in the name of convenience, this fitan will come. Oh, it's easier for me. It saves me time, etc. And ad-dharra 
is pain and suffering. That's what it is. An example of that would be where we or our forefathers would walk two miles to a well to gather water and bring it home. That was difficult, but it's an actual way of life. Today, with one finger, you can turn it. In fact, you can put your hand under the sensor, not even touch anything. The water comes out. But because of this water, you're suffering. You've got calcification going on in your arteries, your kidneys, etc. You got water filled with fluoride and chloride, and it's not the best water to do well do with because well do water has to be pure water. Yep. yep. And so, you know, it's not anyway, yes. So so what I want to say is give a warning to people that if something is being marketed to you on the basis of convenience, be warned. Hmm. That's the sign to look for. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Let's talk about sign. Let's talk about sound. Sound, 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 sound. It's. it's and then we'll sad. end by talking about circus nineteen issue that you brought up. Sound is something that um, one particular people or nation have put a lot of time and a lot of research into it. Unfortunately, it wasn't Muslims. It's that oppressive, occupying Zionist regime in Palestine. But they have got to the point in their research, I've been told by a reliable source, that they have a device that's based on sound. And if they put it on top of a mountain and switch it on, the mountain will crumble. The mountain will turn to dust. I have always tried to simplify things so that I can understand them and explain them. And I always try to look for connections in things. Do these two things have something in common? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared in the Quran that the Quran itself is a shifa for the believers. Because it's the believers that are going to do what with it? What is it that believers do with the Quran that disbelievers don't do? You have to think about this. Now, do the disbelievers study the Quran? Yes, they do. They actually do. But there's something that they don't do that we do. And that is what? It's recitation. They don't recite it. And this is why it's not by accident Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says it's a shifa for the believers. He's indicating that it, its recitation is a shifa for the believers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that honey is a shifa for mankind. And I spent many a year contemplating on the signs of these two. Is there something that they both have in common? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can put a shifa in anything he wants. In anything he wants. You know, there is a story of Musa al Islam. He has a severe headache. And uh, it gets to the point where it's, he can't tolerate it. He makes a dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Ya Musa, go to such and such a valley. And then there is such and such a tree. And then there is such and such a branch. And then such and such a leaf, go and eat that leaf. And Musa al Islam, he goes to the valley, finds a tree, finds a branch, finds a leaf, eats it, shifa, alhamdulillah. A long, long time later, Musa al Islam gets a headache again. What does he do? Does he call to Allah? No, he goes straight to the valley, straight to the tree, straight to the branch, takes a leaf, no shifa. Then he complains. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, Ya Musa, is the shifa in the leaf or me? Where is the shifa coming from? So Allah SWT, he can create a shifa in anything. But he has a sunnah and he has a sabab. He creates a means for things. You know, for example, if I, if I take something, if I take this pen and throw it up, it's going to come down. If I throw it up again, it's going to come down. If I do it a million times, well, guess how many times it's going to come back down? A million times. Yet who controls gravity? Allah. If Allah wanted to, can he reverse gravity? Yes, but he's created a sabab. 
So one day I was sitting and uh, my younger two children were visiting uh, and uh, the older one of them to Ahmed, seven years old at the time, he's now 10. Uh, he was playing and, and uh, it was time for Maghrib Salah. I made wudu, uh, I said to him, you want to pray? He was coloring in, he said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. I said, okay, carry on doing it. I prayed and I sat down and uh, he comes in front of me and he says, uh, well, what are you, are you worried? I says, no. I said, why? He says, you look worried. I said, no, I'm not worried. He said, what are you thinking? I said, I'm just thinking about something. Just kind of brushing him off as parents do. You know, let me do what I'm doing. Go, you do what you do. <laughs> but he's a very persistent young boy. And he came back and he says, tell me what you're thinking about. I said, I'm thinking about something from the Quran. He said, what? So then I sat him down in front of me. I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared in the Quran that the Quran is a shifa. It's a recitation. He's also declared that honey is a shifa. And I'm trying to find out if the two of these things have something in common. You know, is there a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indicating that that is a shifa? Something that we can maybe research more and, and take it to another level and benefit mankind from. A few minutes later, he, he comes up behind me and he starts whispering in, in this ear. Now I'm deaf in this ear. I have no hearing in this ear. So I tell him, I said, look, you're wasting your time. And then he comes to this ear. He says, did you find out what it was? I said, I said, no, it's been a long time. I'm still thinking about it. He says, do you want to know the answer? And I looked at him and I said, ha, ha, ha. And then he comes in front of me and he says, no, really, do you want to know the answer? I said, okay, give me the answer. He said, it's so easy. And he's asking me, is this like a trick question? Are you trying to test me? And I'm like, no, no, tell me what you're thinking. He says, when you recite the Quran, you make a sound and the honeybees make a sound all day when they're making the honey. The shifa is in the sound. Mm. And I was hitting my head. You know, like how blind could you be? Yeah, when you, when you uh, said that, so I was interested in um, some of the research on that. And so let me share with you, if I can, something that came up. We're going to talk about all of this, but I wanted to talk about the honeybee aspect. Uh, we talked about the metabolic crossroads of iron and copper already. Uh, but I wanted to share with you, uh, there is, and uh, here it is, uh, and that is honeybees produce many frequencies of vibration and sound from less than 10 to more than 100 and whatever that technical term is. So far, it has been shown that they detect sound frequencies up to 500 hertz so there is a definite relationship and uh they have actually tried to i guess generate this artificially but honeybee workers generate low low frequency so this is you can say their tasbih and that tasbih causes shifa and so i just wanted that uh just for people's consideration. Yeah, so, so I, I started thinking about sound and what information and knowledge that I had already had about sound. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he creates things in balance. Wherever you go in this dunya, in the human body, in nature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a balance of everything. This mizan is what keeps the world going. Now, Many, many years ago, there was a Russian scientist who identified that every organ within the human body has a different sound frequency or responds to a different sound oh, frequency. Oh, really? Interesting. And he started doing treatments of people from minor ailments to all the way to cancers with very unusual positive success. This whole thing was shut down. I think he's long gone from the world. The device apparently is still available in Russia. But I have came across two or three physicians who really are at the top of their field. 
These are doctors who do not touch pharmacological medicines. They won't touch them. Hmm. And they're doing treatments with um, oral and IV micronutrients. Um, they're doing treatments using sound therapy. So sound is a healing. And I'm thinking to myself, why is it the Muslims didn't get to that level? When we have the Quran and somebody a lot more clever than me over the past 1400 years should have maybe able to identify that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a shifa in the Quran, its recitation. It is the sound. It is the sound. And that person who did the research should have been a Muslim, naturally, but it wasn't. Then on the other side of the back, so this is how sound cures, sound heals, sound regenerates. Then on the other side, I give the example of, you know, this nation, this oppressive Zionist nation state have created something that destroys through sound. And I'm, when I first mentioned that to somebody, a close confidant of mine, he turned and said to me, oh, it's nonsense. And I said, I don't think it is. He said, why? I said, because the Quran indicates that the technology and the science is real. He said, what do you mean? And then so, When the trumpet is blown, every atom, every atom in this universe is going to collapse upon itself. It's going to disintegrate. Hmm. So that's another indication. I don't have to wait for Groundbreaking research. Many, many nations were destroyed Sa'iqa, with a shout. Yes. By yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. So. yes. By <laughs> I don't have to wait for the research. And it, it's almost funny. It's like now that I said this, just came to my mind. It's almost like Western civilization is creating its own death by this noise pollution. And what we called yesterday, you mentioned the word light pollution, you know, and 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 so um they, they know what they are doing. Now, yesterday when we were talking, I was talking about the light of the stars, yeah? And how you will not be able to appreciate the true light of the stars when there is light pollution. Okay, now come back to the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that they want to extinguish the light of Allah. Mm -hmm. They do it by bringing their own false light, their own, everything that Allah has created, they want to replace it with something they think is better. Mm -hmm. Because they are in direct opposition with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we just have to have the capacity to think. How is it that they're going to distinguish, how is it that their attempts to distinguish the light of Allah are going to progress? They're not going to take people back into the Stone Age, they're going to take people into their worst place, which is the future of enlightenment, of dazzling discoveries. They're mm -hmm. going to turn science on its head. You're going to be living in 15-minute cities, you know, with every amenity you can think of, everything at your fingertips, but nothing of your life is going to be natural. Not even the view that you have. Not even the view from your window is going to be natural. It's all going to be fake. And if you allow yourself to be taken away from the natural order, you deserve what's coming to you. You deserve it. So, I, I, I make dua that people wake up. But it's sad to see even people that are woken up, they will not mobilize into action because of what they've already invested in. They've already put their children into university. They've already taken that mortgage out. They've already committed to X number of bills that have to be paid every month. And despite the fact that they can now see what's in front of them, their fear of losing what they have invested is stopping them from progressing forward. And that, for me, is a very sad, sad thing to see. Khair, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts. Let's end by talking about AKG and Circus 19. Okay. So it came to my attention. No, but I want, before you move forward, I want to emphasize sound. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. And what Brother, uh, Brother Jalil is trying to point to is, in the end of his discussion, one of the things he's pointing to is read the Quran. 
it is also a shifa. So just as the iron and copper is an anecdote to the modern Western civilization, uh, whether it is replenishing your copper and iron or in Faraday cages, and the people that are listening, maybe they can come up with things that me and you haven't even thought of. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, as Raqis, what do we do? We say to the patient, get some olive oil, get some water, get some, you know, haba sauda, open up all the bottles, then we do the recitation, don't we? So we're reciting on these things. Now that's basically science. So now you have sound that is being added to things that people are going to drink and bathe with, etc. And that's going to increase the shifa. So when you recite Surah Al-Kahf, and you have iron supplements, and you have copper supplements, or some copper iron jewelry, then recite it on it. You do everything complete. So uh, I'll give you, for example, when I, whenever I recite the Quran, I always make an intention. So why am I reciting? And one of the, in the, the phrases that I use in my intention is that I am reciting it to get noor and purification of the heart. It's one of them. Then you do the recitation. You recite Al-Fatiha first, you do the recitation, you finish. Then I make a dua. I make a dua for purification of the heart. Then there is a beautiful dua. You know, we have Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi noora wa fi lisani noora wa fi sam'i noora wa fi basari noora Allahumma ja'al fi nafsi noora You know, and on and on. Then you're making dua for noor. So, on Friday, when you recite Surah Al-Kahf, you should be taking a minute before you open the Quran to just talk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, I am reciting Surah Al-Kahf because it has reached me that the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said so and so, and it is with that intent that I recite the Surah, then you recite the Surah and then you finish it and make the Dua for Noor. We need to start connecting dots. Uh, so when you have some amal that you do, whether it's a wazifa or something in the Quran that you recite, don't compartmentalize it like the people of the West do. Think, why am I doing it? Then the action itself, and then you know, make tawbah and, and make a dua. Then how can you not get more? Because you're asking for it. There's a difference between that person and the person who says, well, I just recite Surah Al-Kahf every week and I don't know any difference. Well, did you make niyyah? Did you recite Al-Fatiha before it? Did you make a dua for noor after it? You know, I even, when I finish Surah Al-Kahf, I'll actually spend maybe 10 minutes and I'm just reciting the ayahs, Ba'ad A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajim, Allahu Waliyu Ladina Amanu Yukhrijuhum Min Adhulamati Ilan Noor, or Allahu Nooru Samamati Wal Ard, repeated, 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 and then I make my dua. As you're putting all the pieces together. Okay, so read Quran. Sound is powerful. And you know what's interesting? Uh, Allah mentions, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشيا متصدي من خشية الله If we sent down this Quran in a mountain, it would tear into pieces out of the fear of Allah. So they can create their sound and we have our sound. We just need to use it apply it, absorb it, and to become that vibration. And uh, then miracles will happen. Now, AK, uh, EKG and Circus 19. Okay. So uh, it had come to my attention lately um, that the FAA, the Federal Aviation Authority, uh, in the UK, our equivalent is the Civil Aviation Authority. The FAA, normally what they do when they recruit pilots and part of uh, general testing for pilots' fitness to fly, they do an ECG, an electrocardiogram. So in a normal ECG, you have waves. You know, you have like a P wave, a QRS complex, a T wave, W wave, etc. And individual points are marked by the P, the Q, the R, S, T. Since the advent of ECGs, 
more than 100 years ago, I think it's been now. Uh, cardiologists and specialists in medicine have always recognized that the interval, the distance between the P and the R has a normal value. The minimum normal value is 0 0.12 seconds. And the maximum normal value is 0 0.2 seconds. So any ECG that shows a PR value of less than 0 0.12 or more than 0 0.2 is considered abnormal. And such a person would be referred to a cardiologist for further assessment. Hmm. The FAA has always held to that rule. The FAA are responsible for the fitness of pilots, for flying, for aviation, so many things. They have always held to that. So if they have a pilot who's been away on vacation for two weeks, they come back, they have to have an ECG done before they fly, and it's more than 0 0.2, sorry, you're declared as unfit to fly, go to a cardiologist, get some tests done, and then we'll repeat the ECG when the cardiologist tells us. When you fall within the range of normal, you can fly again. Some months after the thing, the circus nineteen <laughs> that people are getting, that people are getting in their in their arms, was rolled out. The FAA very quietly, without telling anybody anything, giving a reason, increased the upper limit, the upper margin of the PR interval. They changed it from zero point two to zero point three. That's a massive increase. And I have to think, why would they do that? Mm. Only one reason fits why they would do that. They would only do it because they have pilot after pilot after pilot after pilot coming to have ECGs done, and their ECGs are falling out with the normal range. What should they actually? I remember that at one point I was hearing about pilots not being able to fly, and then that news kind of just went away, and I didn't pursue it. But I do remember listening to something like this. What they should have done was say to every one of those pilots who fell out with the normal range, you're not fit to fly. Had they done that, they would have brought the airline aviation industry to its knees. Had they done that, because that's how many pilots were being affected. And then also with that, it reminds me of all the young athletes that have been dying. We have more athlete, young athletes that have died in the last two, three years than ever before, like yes. professional athletes. Yes. I've, I've counted 400 so far. 400 so far, and that's like unheard of. You yeah. wouldn't even find you wouldn't find half that in a 20 year period. If there was 200 in a 20 year period, that would be like shocking. Something going on in these investigation. We now have 400 in two years, and nobody's caring. Nobody's asking, and there are people who should know are actually telling lies as to the cause. So instead of sticking with the rules. And this is where a warning bell should be going off in the heads of Muslims, because we have the Quran, and in the Quran, there are rules. We have to follow rules. But these people, instead of following their own rules or what is safe, what did they do? They changed the rule. What kind of people do that? Oh, that same Zionist oppressive state sitting in Palestine, they change the rules. And so now you have so many, Allah SWT, he knows how many there are, pilots who have what a cardiolo cardiologist would call a cardiac injury, mm -hmm. a heart problem, flying planes. And these people have to make very quick decisions in a short space of time. Added to that, the FAA has been discussing changing the rules of two pilots per commercial flight. They're now thinking about the possibility and the probability 
of having just one. Oh, wow. To play. And when I discussed this with somebody, the person I was talking to said, expect planes to fall at the sky, if that's what they're going to do. You can expect planes to fall at the sky. Hmm. So the types of injury that result from an extended PR interval are like atrial fibrillation, where the heart, it has its normal pace. That normal pace is broken. It may skip a beat. It may do two or three extra beats. If you have had the thing and you have experienced palpitations, I'm willing to bet you have a prolonged PR interval. Mm. Some of these patients will require a pacemaker. It's an electrical device that's put into your body that controls the electrical beat to the heart. And some of those patients will go on to die. So it can be a very, very serious issue. Now, while that news was coming to me and I was doing some research, again, as I said, the memory banks that I have, I start to pull out all of the things that are related to it. And I remember reading a few articles and talking to a few physicians who were of the opinion, and it's now fact, at the time it was opinion, it's now scientific fact, that the majority of heart problems are caused by a problem with your teeth or oral cavity. Let me repeat that. The majority of problems of your heart are caused by a problem with your teeth and or oral cavity. I am now forced to turn to the words of my beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said, beware, there is a piece of flesh in the body of man. If that piece of flesh is wholesome and healthy, the entire body will be wholesome and healthy. Mm -hmm. If that piece of flesh is diseased, the entire body will be diseased. Mm. Beware, that piece of flesh is the heart. So, I'm now, what I'm doing is I'm placing in front of you items, and at the end, I'm going to connect them all, okay? So we know that the oral cavity has an influence over the health of the heart. Mm. We know that the health of the heart has an influence over the whole body. So now I have to ask myself, is there a relationship between physical and spiritual health and physical and spiritual disease? I have to ask the question. Hmm. It is my opinion that when the heart is physically damaged, there is spiritual damage happening too. In fact, I'm going to go further than that. I'm going to go so far as to say they never intended for there to be any physical damage to your heart. They only wanted the spiritual damage. But because the heart is, for me, the heart is Majma al Bahrain. Mm -hmm. It is that place where external knowledge and internal insight come together. It is the joining of the physical and the spiritual, the ruh and the body. So if you can cause spiritual harm by causing physical harm to the heart, then my next question is, the people who have had the thing and have had a cardiac injury, whether it's an extended PR interval, whether it's myocarditis, can you then fix the physical by treating the spiritual? 
And the indications are, yes. I'm now going to go back to this oral cavity. And I have to think, is this the reason why we are commanded that when we pray for the Salah, it is not valid if the tongue is not moving when we recite Al-Fatiha in the Quran? And, and also I want to add to that, that how particular the Prophet was in Miswak, which meant he cared about his oral hygiene, which meant that then he had a good heart physically, which meant that's an indication of his spiritual state. And he was known by the people around him as being physically strong, physically beautiful, physically strong. You know, on three occasions, you know, wrestling with Umar. I mean, Umar, he's not a small man. Umar is a giant. Mm. And the Rasulullah throws him on his back, you know, three times. And they're just playing. So, and then spiritually, it's evident where the Rasulullah was spiritually. So the health of the heart, when Rasulullah is talking about the health of the heart, reflecting the health of the body, he's talking just not about the physical, he's talking about mental, he's talking about emotional, he's talking about spiritual as well. Mm. I guarantee it. So when we recite the Quran, the tongue is moving. So all of these things, bring all of these things together, the miswak, okay, the speaking good things, not doing a riba, protection of the tongue, um, the moving of the tongue when you are in your prayer, mm. the command of keeping the tongue moist with the dhikr of Allah, and the sound produced by the recitation of the Quran. For those who have been Injured by this thing, make the niyyah, recite the Quran, clean the mouth, make istighfar, and then make the dua for recovery of the heart. Mm. And inshallah, you'll see the benefit. And use iron and copper. Iron and copper for ongoing protection. You got to put all these things together, all of them together. And there are just signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this iron and copper of the wall of Dhul Karnay and minerals inside your body. And going back to the ayah that you mentioned yesterday where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, we will show them signs from amongst, from within themselves unto the horizon. And yet we remain blind. The people who the Quran has been sent to remain blind by the way, the other party, they understand it because they're using the same source of knowledge for destruction. And we're not able to use that source of knowledge for the reason it was sent, which is a rahmah onto mankind. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing. So yeah, physical damage of the heart. I believe that they were trying to cause only spiritual damage. I believe that they're trying to take us away from the rope, the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's going to get worse. I think the second wave is upon us. Uh, the most recent one, subhanAllah. You know, when was it in signs that you heard the names of things in signs coming from science fiction? They called the last train the Kraken. Hmm. Now, anybody who doesn't know what the Kraken is, there was a television program I used to come on when I was six, seven years old. It was called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Mm. And there would be this octopus that would come out now and again and attack you, and they called it the Kraken. Okay. I have to ask myself, why are they calling a virus strain the Kraken? Mm. And if I just look into it, it's to cause fear. Because when I at the age that I am at now, think back of that program, I still shiver. This big octopus coming out of the darkness and grabbing the submarine and it disappears. Then also I added to that is, well, the word Kraken is only something that people of my age recognize. The 20 and 30 year olds, doesn't mean anything to them. 
Mm -hmm. For them, it's Freddy Krueger or Voldemort. Do you understand? So that also tells me who this strain is targeting. Do you understand? They're targeting a certain age group. The previous one, it was the over 60s. This one is the 40 to 60s. And the next one is going to be the 20 to 30s. By the name, you'll be able to recognize who they're targeting. That's mm -hmm. how clever these people are. They understand psychology better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. They understand science. They understand sound waves better than anybody else. But we have to start thinking. Yeah. And yet we have a people in this world who call themselves Muslim, and they say that only Allah and his soul can interpret the Quran. And they are limiting, preventing people from thinking. People need to break free from that. And they need to start thinking and talking and discussing with their ulama and bringing their own specialist field of knowledge that they have and going to the Quran and see if there's connections there. That's what they have to do. So using iron and copper, recitation of the Quran, using sound as healing, find physicians who can heal organs of the body through sound waves, and then add it to that um, vitamin supplements, whether it's oral or IV, high doses of vitamin C, glutathione, magnesium, zinc, copper, iron, put them back into your body and get wholesome again. I have very, very, very strong views on what you consume and your relationship with Allah. Very strong views. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared in the Quran that your food has to fulfill two criteria. It has to be halal, spiritual, and it has to be tayyib, meaning good, meaning wholesome. If you know that the soil has been ruined, if you know that they're using chemicals on your plants, and then you go to eat those plants. How can you consider them permissible when Allah has decreed it has to fulfill two requirements? Any doctor of any faith will tell you, you are what you eat. And if what you're eating is not halal and wholesome, then it's not going to produce those that the Quran was sent for a people who can think, a people who can think independently, and a people who, when they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah responds. Mm -hmm. We already know the consequences of consuming haram, whether it be something you put in your mouth, whether it be clothes that you put on your back because of the riba, the way we do business, that you're wasting your time making a dua. You really are wasting your time. Some scholars might, out of kindness, say, okay, if you make tawbah, then it's okay. I'll, I won't agree with that because I know how long that haram that you put in your mouth is going to stay inside your cells for. It's going to get broken down. The nutrients are going to get taken out. They'll go to the cell. They'll go into the mitochondria. And it's going to be three months before it's out of your system. Do you think your dua is going to be accepted while it's still in your system? And you don't know what difficulty you're going to face in those three months. It might be the most might be the most critical time in your life where you have a need to turn to Allah. And yet you put something in your mouth, didn't think about it too much because you were out with your friends. And it's going to be in your system for three months. It's going to prevent your dua from going anywhere. These are serious things. Yes. I, <laughs> I take everything back to the stomach. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the majority of diseases of man originate from a container that he inappropriately fills. So that vessel is the stomach. What you put in your stomach is what you will be. If you have disorders and diseases, the first place you go to is your stomach. So I've done a lot of research and a lot of work on understanding the gut microbiome, 
and how to influence it, how to change it so that you have a strong immune system, so that you're protected. And not only that, but so that when you make a dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds. Inshallah. Because we, we know and we understand that it is only the pure that will enter the garden. Is that correct? And most of the scholars just go to the purity of the heart. Yes, that's important. But if you've been putting haram into your gut and your gut breaks down that food and sends those nutrients to your heart to function and push the blood all over your body, then tell me how much purity is left in the heart. It all begins with the food. If you don't fix out what you're consuming, you can waste your time doing Qiyamul Layl all night long every, every night with very little benefit. You'll get the ajar of standing, but nothing's going to change in your life. You want change to take place? Fix your food. Mm. So I have developed uh, a protocol of nutrients that I have identified the majority of us are deficient in and so many are clinically deficient meaning you've got symptoms and to protect ourselves from what's coming I also have a separate protocol for those who have had the thing because they are people who have got cardiac injury myocarditis and they're producing the spike protein continuously is going to cause them harm for the rest of their life. For the people that want to reach you on email, um, do you have an email that you might want to let people know, or you can give it to me and I can put it on the description? Yeah, so um, if the title will have my name on it, Jalil Akhtar, then my email address is Jalil Akhtar, no spaces, no dots, at icloud.com now I'm going to be a little bit harsh it's going to appear to be harsh but what I'm saying is goodness if you're going to contact me and ask for the protocol for yourself the condition must be that you have either started or that you have made an agreement with Allah to recite the Quran and take no longer than one lunar month to complete it. If the niya and the effort is not there, then my dua is that whatever you take from me does not benefit you. Now, I'm sorry that may be harsh because there's a lot of people who are in desperate need and they're sick and everything that you have to start with the Quran. Ikra, Ikra, Bismira, Ibda, Ikra. Okay. Got that, Alhamdulillah. Okay, this is sufficient for today, inshallah. And we will have other conversations, inshallah, soon too. Inshallah, in the future. Again, I ask you, uh, and I ask your viewers uh, to make sincere dua for me, uh, my family. No need to make comments about it. You know, the dua, the dua is not done on a computer, you know. You, you you pray, you raise your hands to Allah and, and that's it, it's done. Allah knows who I am and Allah knows who the viewers are, you know. Uh, so I ask for people to make sincere dua. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the ulama. There are so many ulama that have left the dunya. There are so many that are leaving and it's worrying that what's going to happen to knowledge. Actually, it's it, it causes me to shiver, you know, in fear. Of what state the ummah is going to be left in uh, we're not who are we going to turn to for guidance? You know, who are we going to turn to for knowledge? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the ulama, those who have left the dunya, those who are still here, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to benefit from that knowledge and that we may have within our hands a tight grasp of the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen. Allahumma ameen ya Rabb. Allahumma sunni ala Muhammad. Okay, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Inshallah. Barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.